Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, so it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce Jessica Davis, uh, who will be talking on her uh, MagSat solver, uh, which uh, won uh, industrial categories in, in weighted MagSat uh, last year. And um, so, please uh, go ahead. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Jessica is uh, visiting from the uh, University of Toronto, uh, where she's currently a postdoc and will be at IST later this year. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak at Microsoft and to visit uh, here for a couple of days. Um, so this is work that I did as part of my PhD thesis last year. And I'll be talking today about how to solve MaxSat by decoupling optimization and satisfaction. So first I'll just define the MaxSat problem. So it's an optimization version of the SAT problem. And the input to a MaxSat problem is just a propositional logic formula in conjunctive normal form, where uh, a formula is in conjunctive normal form if it's a conjunction of clauses, and each clause is a disjunction of literals, which are variables or their negations. Now, in contrast to the SAT problem, here in MaxSat, we have, for every clause in the formula, an associated cost or weight, which is, represents the um, cost of falsifying that clause. So in general, in a MaxSat problem, all of the clauses can't be satisfied. Some of them must be falsified. And this is how the cost is how important they are um, to satisfy. So the goal is to find a truth assignment that has minimum cost, um, which falsifies the least weight of clauses. So in this example, we have a MaxSat formula. Um, the L uh, sub 1, sub 2, sub 3 are, are three different uh, Boolean variables. And the first four clauses are soft clauses. Soft clauses are ones whose cost is less than infinity. So here we have costs of 3, 4, 1, and 10. And finally, we have a clause which is called hard because it has an infinite cost. That means that in the MaxSat solution, it must be satisfied. Then for every uh, possible truth assignment, like shown in this truth table, uh, there's an associated cost. For example, if we assign L1, L2, and L3 all to zero or false, then the first, um, the first clause will be satisfied, incurring no cost. The second clause incurs a cost of four, and the fourth clause incurs a cost of 10, so for a total cost of 14. So the MaxSat solution is just a truth assignment that achieves the minimum cost. In this case, um, it is this truth assignment L1 to true, L2 to true, L3 false, and it has cost three. So uh, there are many applications potentially of MaxSat because MaxSat is complete for a complexity class FP to the NP, which it contains all functions that are computable in polynomial time uh, with access to an NP oracle. So uh, many different problems that fall into this class could be efficiently expressed as MaxSat. And there are applications currently in fields like bioinformatics, electronic design automation, operations research, et cetera. So now I'll turn our atten my attention to solving MaxSat using integer programming. So it's very easy to formulate a MaxSat problem as an integer program. Integer programming is um, mathematical programming where all of the constraints are linear inequalities over integer variables. And the objective function is um, to maximize or minimize a linear constraint over the integer variables. So in this case, we've got the MaxSat formula and all of the cl clauses here have been encoded as linear inequalities. Um, simple encoding, which actually adds um, these new fresh variables to every clause. So the first, the first uh, linear inequality there states that either L1 is assigned to zero or B1 has to be assigned to one. Now these um, fresh variables, I'll call them B variables, allow the different clauses of the MaxSat formula to be falsified or relaxed. And the goal is to minimize the sum of the costs of the B variables which are used. So the, um, 
we use these in the objective function of the integer program. And the weights of those soft clauses become the coefficients of the objective function. So a solution to this integer program, or a zero one integer program, will be uh, correspond to a solution to the maxat problem, where you just drop um, the assignment to the new b variables. So MIP solvers um, are a very sophisticated technique to solve integer programs. For example, they're implemented in um, IBM's CPLEX or Gorobi solvers, and they use um, an algorithm called branch and cut. So branch and cut relies on solving a linear relaxation of the integer program. A linear relaxation is obtained just by relaxing the integrality constraints on all of the variables. So instead of requiring them to be value zero or one, we allow the variables to take on any value in the range zero to one. And if we solve the linear relaxation, for example, using uh, an algorithm like CPLEX, which usually runs in polynomial time, then the cost of the solution to the linear relaxation will be a lower bound on the true optimum of the original integer program. And in the case where the solution to the linear relaxation is integral, all the variables take on zero or one, then it's also a solution to the original integer program. So in the branch and cut um, approach, we at the root node, we solve the original um, linear relaxation of the original problem. And if the solution to the linear relaxation doesn't assign all the variables integral values, we can derive a cutting plane, which will exclude that solution of the linear relaxation, and then resolve the relaxation and iterate solving the linear relaxation, adding a cutting plane, until either the um, solution to the linear program is integral, or we just give up. We say, OK, this is taking too long. And we instead, we decide to branch on a particular setting of a variable. So we can set the variable to its two possible values, and that produces um, restricted by those values. We get two different subproblems. And all of the different subproblems that are generated in this way are solved um, using a best first search. So how does uh, integer programming actually work on instances of MaxSat? So we, we did some experiments uh, with CPLEX, and we took all instances from the previous MaxSat evaluations. So these are international evaluations held every year since 2006. And they have uh, three categories of problems. Random problems have been randomly generated, crafted, and industrial problems. So we exclude the random instances because usually different techniques have to be used in those cases. Uh, and we just report the performance on 3,826 problems um, that are in crafted in industrial categories. So this is the total number of problems that were solved within the resource bounds um, by three uh, state-of-the-art MaxSat solvers in comparison to CPLEX. And we can see that the total number of problems that CPLEX can solve is, uh, is, very, is very good in comparison to the state-of-the-art in MaxSat. So when CPLEX solves the linear relaxation, it, it gets um, floating point values for the... Yes, yes, uh, it's floating point, yes. But, but uh, it's sound? Uh, they, there can be some numerical issues in, inside CPLEX, for sure. And there's some tolerances and things. So it's not an exact, it's not an exact is, is, solver. Does CPLEX guarantee uh, to solve zero one problems? No, no, it, it makes no particular guarantee, no. No, it has, a, it has some um, tolerances within which it can guarantee that it is within that much from the optimum, okay. but that, that's all. So, so could CPLEX give wrong results for these uh, categories? But it I, I think that it would, I, I, honestly, I don't, I don't know if there are any cases where it will give you a wrong result. But I suppose depending on the, the costs and the objective function, and there may be. But I'm not, I'm not, my background is definitely not in uh, like mathematical programming. Yeah. So I mean, if, if, if it, CPLEX does give you an incorrect answer, 
I don't know. We're not but too worried about that. Other, so but, but when you compare to, what, on the benchmarks, it can't provide answers. It does, yeah. yeah. It never, I've never observed it to never, observed never it, ever so observed it to right. give a wrong answer. Right. No, no. Yeah, if that's, for yeah. practical purposes. Yeah, for practical purposes, it's very trustworthy, I would say. Yeah. Just like Z3. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, OK. OK, so I, I suppose you could probably implement the branch and cut algorithm in a way that, uh, under some conditions, gave you some guarantees. But I'm not, I'm not interested. So OK, so there were some cases where CPLEX is outperformed and can it basically times out on problems that are easy for other MaxSat solvers to solve. And those come from applications like bioinformatics or circuit debugging, planning, scheduling, and timetabling. So on the other hand, MaxSat is also very closely related to the SAT problem. And we can look at how would a SAT solver be able to address MaxSat problems. And this is just a one slide about how SAT solvers work. Just to remind you, it's um, a conflict-directed clause learning uh, algorithm. It basically uses a depth first search rather than the, the breadth first or best first search of a branch and cut. And in contrast to solving a linear relaxation, um, the form of inference that's applied at every node is just very lightweight um, binary constraint propagation or unit propagation, which just assigns any literal appearing in a unit clause to the value that will satisfy that clause. And as the search progresses, if a clause is falsified, that's called a conflict. And we can analyze how the SAT solver um, reached that conflict in order to derive a learnt clause, which is soundly implied by the SAT formula. And the learnt clauses are very important because they can be used to both guide the search through the uh, adjusting the branching heuristic, as well as um, they enable the search space to be pruned and ultimately a proof of unsatisfiability to be generated. So in my work, uh, the goal is to really combine uh, MIP and SAT technology in order to solve the MaxSAT problem. Because both MIP and SAT solvers are very mature and powerful um, techniques, but they are definitely known to have divergent strengths. So we're, we're interested in combining those strengths in order to solve an optimization problem with logical constraints. In the, the approach that we introduce is called MaxHS. And it's a hybrid approach, which uses a MIP solver and a SAT solver as black boxes. The MIP solver is going to be responsible for the optimization, while the SAT solver is responsible for what it's good at, which is reasoning about the logical constraints. And we, this, this MaxHS approach is, offers a rich design space. And we investigate several different um, points in this space. And we can show that the MaxHS solver results in uh, one of the most robust solvers for MaxSAT. So first, I'll just make a couple of definitions, which are important to the MaxHS approach. Uh, in a, given a MaxSAT formula, a core is defined to be any subset of the soft clauses, which together with the hard clauses is inconsistent. So in this example, um, we have a core K1, which can, uh, is comprised of the first two soft clauses. And you can see that when taken together with the hard clause, uh, they're, they're contradictory. And if we have a collection of cores, so on the left here, we've got three different cores. Um, the first core contains three clauses, C1, C3, and C10. Then we can define a hitting set of this collection of cores to be a subset of the soft clauses that includes at least one clause from each of those cores. So in this case, a possible hitting set would be um, C3 and C5, including those two clauses. And we are interested in the cost of these possible hitting sets. So the cost of a hitting set is just the sum of the costs of the clauses it contains. And in general, we're going to be interested in finding hitting sets of minimum cost. So we make a, a, a couple of observations uh, with, about the cores and the hitting sets. First of all, if you consider any truth assignment that satisfies the hard clauses of the MaxSat formula, then it must falsify at least one clause in each of the cores, because the core has no satisfying assignment. And this uh, leads us directly to the following theorem, which is if we have some collection of cores and we have a minimum cost hitting set of them, then if we remove that hitting set from the entire MaxSat formula F 
and there's a satisfying assignment to the remaining uh, formula, then that satisfying assignment is actually a maxat solution. So based on that intuition, we could define the MaxHS, basic MaxHS algorithm. In the algorithm, uh, we start with two sets. So we've got the hitting set, current hitting set, and a current collection of known cores. We ask the SAT solver, if we exclude the current hitting set from the formula, is the remaining formula satisfiable or not? If it is satisfiable, then the satisfying assignment is a MaxSAT solution by the theorem on the previous slide. Otherwise, if the SAT solver uh, refutes this uh, formula still, then the SAT solver is able to provide a new core, um, which can be added to the collection of known cores. We must update the hitting set to be a hitting set given the addition of that new core. And then we repeat and check to see if, that, if we exclude that hitting set, will the remainder of the formula be satisfiable? So these iterations uh, continue, collecting new cores, adding them to the collection, resolving the hitting set problem, until we have um, a minimum hitting set, which leaves a satisfiable formula, and then the algorithm terminates. So, it, so this solution is guaranteed to be the best solution? Yes, yes, yeah, because in, um, so the, the cost of this solution is at most the cost of the formula minus the cost of the hitting set, right? Because it can only, it can only falsify, it satisfies everything that's not in the hitting set. Well, what is, what is bugging me about it is that suppose you start out with an empty hitting set. Yeah. For the first time, you go into that diamond, mm -hmm. uh, HS is empty, so you are finding a satisfying assignment of the entire problem. Yeah. And then if you find it, you just output it, right? But it yeah. could be something completely, a random satisfying assignment it might not be the best well, satisfying assignment in that case, so you would just exit early. Well, I guess the, the, one, the one thing that might, might clarify this is that in general, the F is going to be unsatisfiable. So when the hitting set is empty, the first time through this loop, it won't, it won't um, be able to find, the SAT solver won't be able to find a solution. Oh, I see, I see. You're right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the because whole if you unsatisfied. manage to satisfy everything, then that's great. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, then the max that solution yes. has zero yeah. cost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But what, what's intriguing is that you know, it suffices to satisfy the minimal hitting set with respect to the set of current core. Known cores. Known yeah. Cores. So that theorem that you have in the previous slide, yeah. I, I mean, I was trying to prove it, but I, it's not yeah, that obvious. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a little bit. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's, okay. a, it's, 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 a very, it's very sort of very straightforward, actually. So it's based on the fact that the, so the cost of any truth assignment has to be at least the cost of a minimum cost hitting set of the cores. Because any truth assignment has to falsify at least one clause in every core, which means its cost is at least the cost of a hitting set, minimum hitting set. So you can do no better than that. And then the fact that there's a satisfying assignment proves that you don't have to do any worse than that. So in so you know that um, we've got a lower bound on the MaxSat solution, and this provides an upper bound. So who proved that theorem first? Me. You did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was yeah. If you write it down, it's not. It's not. It's not really nice. complicated, but yeah. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of nice because the really the thing that's nice about it is that you it's clear it's easier to prove that if you've got all cores then a minimum cost hitting set of them is a max sat solution. In this case, we might be able to get away with a much smaller subset of cores, just a small number of them, not all of them. OK. So it's correct. Uh, if it terminates, it's correct by that theorem. And then the argument that it terminates is basically that um, every core that you derive in every iteration is different from all previous cores because uh, it, the hitting set um, excludes all previous cores. So if you take away the hitting set, the, the new core has to be a subset of the formula without that hitting set. So since you get a different core in every loop um, and there's a finite number of possible cores, the, the loop eventually terminates. 
So we solve the SAT problem, the SAT queries, using um, a SAT solver. We we're using Minisat. And we solve the minimum hitting set problem by encoding it as an integer programming problem and calling Cplex. So let's talk about the behavior of this basic algorithm. First of all, it's kind of nice because it's incremental, which means if you terminate it at any time, you do get a lower bound and possibly an upper bound on the true cost of the max set solution. However, there's at least three different possible sources of exponential uh, behavior within this algorithm. First of all, at every iteration, we're solving a SAT problem that could take a long time. Second of all, we're solving a hitting set problem at every iteration. That's also NP hard. And third of all, we might need a very large number of cores, or this we might require many iterations. And in the worst case, that is actually an exponential number of cores is needed. So we implemented this basic algorithm using Minisat and Cplex, and um, we tr tried it on those instances from the previous MaxSat evaluations. And in this uh, slide, I'm just showing where is that time spent between the Cplex and the SAT solver? Uh, where is most of that runtime being spent? And splitting the instances into the ones that were solved and the ones that were unsolved during the resource limits, we are looking at the percentage of time, total runtime, that was spent in Cplex. And in both the solved and unsolved instances, the percentage of runtime spent in Cplex is very high. It's frequently very high. And in unsolved instances in particular, it looks like most of the time is being spent um, solving those minimum hitting set problems. So how can, we, how can we improve the performance of MaxHS uh, using this intuition that the, CPL, that the minimum hitting set problems are, um, are taking up most of the runtime? So we have three basic approaches to improving the basic MaxHS algorithm. First of all, perhaps we can give better constraints to Cplex. So Cplex doesn't have all information about the original MaxSat formula. It only has the cores that you give it. So maybe if we could inform Cplex better, it would propose better hitting sets and the, the process would be um, more efficient. Second of all, perhaps we can generate the constraints, the cores, more cheaply. Because we're using a SAT solver at the moment that could be expensive. Maybe there's some information we give, can give to Cplex in, that we can derive in a more efficient manner. And third of all, we could try to give Cplex multiple constraints at a time. In the algorithm I showed you, we give Cplex a core, and we ask it to resolve its optimization problem. Then we give it another core. It has to resolve. And so maybe there's some way to shove it, like a whole collection of cores at once. And then we would have to solve the hitting set problem less frequently. So first of all, how can we give better constraints than these cores to Cplex? We can observe that we're getting a core from the SAT solver. And the SAT solver may include in that core clauses that were irrelevant to the reason why the core is unsatisfiable. So instead of um, keeping these irrelevant clauses around, we could try to minimize the cores and make sure that we only give minimal cores to Cplex. So a minimal core is just one whose any proper subset of it is no longer a core. So we can use, um, we're, ju we're just using a simple greedy algorithm, which checks if each clause of the core can be removed by using an additional call to a SAT solver. And in this way, we can make sure that we're only sending minimal cores to Cplex. Secondly, uh, we can observe that there are many uh, constraints on which clauses can be falsified or satisfied together. And these are constraints that Cplex is unaware of because we're only giving it some information. So for example, um, if you have any, any clauses that contain conflicting literals, like L1 and not L1, it's clearly they cannot be falsified at the same time um, because any truth assignment will satisfy at least one of these clauses. So there's no point for Cplex to put both of these clauses in the minimum hitting set because that hitting set cannot possibly correspond to the max set solution. So we'd like to give some of this information that Cplex is missing um, to Cplex so it's better informed. However, some of these uh, constraints are not in the form of cores. So on the left-hand side, um, we have two relaxed soft clauses 
that imply this constraint. Oh, yeah. So the actually the problem that you're giving to Cplex is not even aware of the Boolean interpretation of yeah. all these variables. Yeah, yeah. It's just the Cplex only knows about the b only knows about these b variables. It doesn't know anything about the original constraints in the MaxSat formula. So it's quite blind. It doesn't have much information about what it's doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, this is how we get a core. The core says that either this clause corresponding to B3 or this clause corresponding to B4 is going to be falsified. Uh, in this case, we have a constraint over the B variables, which is not cor doesn't correspond to a core. It says that you can't possibly um, falsify this clause and this clause at the same time because they contain the conflicting literals. So any, any uh, constraint, any causal constraint over B variables that includes negations, uh, we call a non-core constraint. So we'd like to be able to um, give, derive some of these constraints and give them to Cplex. We can do that, actually, by modifying the formula that the SAT solver is solving by setting up a strict equivalence between these relaxation variables and the negation of the soft clause that they appear in. So now um, the, the B variable, if you assign it to true, that enforces that the clause it belongs to will be falsified. So if you add just these um, equivalence clauses to the SAT solver, then the SAT solver will be able to return non-core constraints. And once we make this modification, Cplex is obviously not solving a pure hitting set problem anymore. But that's something that uh, Cplex is, is actually able to, able to do because it's not uh, a true hitting set solver. It's uh, more general than that. Do you know, uh, does Cplex use different algorithms if they input this pure hitting set? I think it, it, it might, it might, because it's the same as a set cover problem, and they might, they might be able to identify that form, because it's, it's an important problem in operations research. Set cover, yeah. So it's, set, it's like set cover with some side constraints, and who knows at what point, you know, Cplex will, Cplex's performance will degrade. Um, Okay, so that, that was, those are a couple different ways that we can add better constraints to Cplex. Now, is there some way that we can derive more constraints in a cheaper way than calls to the SAT solver? So uh, we, we propose to, instead of using SAT, a uh, call to a SAT solver to find a B variable constraint, to just use the cheaper forms of inference, like unit propagation, failed literal detection, um, to derive constraints over the B variables and then uh, seed the Cplex model with a collection of constraints derived in that way prior to solving um, the MaxSat problem using the regular iterations of MaxHS. So there's two, two ways that we can derive um, some, some constraints over the B variables. The first is called equivalent seeding. And this is just based on the observation that if the original MaxSat formula had uh, clauses unit soft clauses containing only one, only one literal. When we introduce this equivalence between the B variable and the original soft clause, it implies that original literal and an original literal is actually equivalent to one of these relaxation variables. So what we do is we scan through all of the clauses of the MaxSat formula, and we look for any clause that has, contains literals, all of which are equivalent to relaxation variables. And then we can just replace those literals with the equivalent relaxation variables. And that way, derive a constraint over only the B variables that can be added to Cplex. And so that way, we give some of the constraints of the original MaxSat formula to Cplex. These are the hard clauses. And they can also be the soft clauses. And going further than that, we can spend a little bit more time to drive additional constraints. And we do this by doing something like a failed literal detection, where for each of the B variables, uh, we perform a trial unit propagation. So we set that variable to true, and then we perform unit propagation, and we collect all of the other B variables which have been um, implied via unit propagation. And if we have these uh, variables which are implied by bi, bi1 to bik, 
then it represents k binary implication clauses, which can be compactly encoded as just one linear constraint and given to cplex. So we could, uh, we could think of um, other ways that we could project the original maxat formula over the b variables. And you know, that might be an interesting line for future research. So let's see how those ideas of driving better constraints um, and driving them more cheaply have, are, affect the performance of MaxHS. So in this, um, this reports results on all of those instances from the previous MaxAd evaluations that are non-random. And the, on the x-axis is just a number of problems solved within the resource bounds. And these versions of MaxHS are the following. So the first version here is the basic algorithm that I showed you, um, that I described to you first. I you yeah, yeah. What does it mean to solve an optimization problem? Uh, it, it means to find the optimum. So is the optimum known for these problems? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, as far as I know, like you said earlier, like the so standard solvers that are used to solve yeah. these problems, they provide no guarantees, right? So one, one fine day they can say, this is the optimal solution. What what is the basis for believing that that is the optimal solution? Um, is there something like an oracle that has been previously enumerated all the possible solutions and actually vetted that this is the most optimal okay. solution? Well, okay, so theoretically, you could enumerate all of the different, there's a finite number of possible right. solutions, so yes. you just enumerate them all, and calculating their cost is, you can do that without sure. any sort of numerical so has issues somebody probably. Done that for all these problems? No, but the way that we believe that we have correct results is that there are many different MaxSat solvers, and they've all reported the same, the same value. So this value is achievable, we know that. The yeah. fact that there's no better value is um, basically these methods are theoretically complete. If they've been implemented correctly, uh, they provide a guarantee. So it's but relying when, on when correct Nicola implementation. I asked you this question earlier. It was you said that. Huh? It was about that was about CPLEX. Some of these other techniques are, are um, yeah, sort of better. Um, I see. Yeah, better than yeah, that. So there are other techniques that, have, yeah, that provide yeah. some guarantees. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, they basically rely on a SAT solver. So it depends, they would, their correctness would rely on the correctness of a SAT solver, if you feel comfortable with that. And you can, prob you can verify um, the output of a SAT solver. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is, um, this is the baseline, max HS. This is in you, when you take minimal cores, you get a big jump in performance. This is when you introduce the equivalence, the strict equivalence between B, the relaxation variables and the soft clauses uh, so that you can derive non-core constraints. And then these are, this is when you add the seeding where you derive a bunch of constraints cheaply using um, unit propagation and you get another gain in performance. Okay, so now, um, the other major bottleneck of MaxHS we observed was the time spent solving the hitting set problems to optimality. So a natural question arises, how could we use um, a heuristic or an approximation to this optimization problem? And could we use that within the MaxHS algorithm? So part of the problem is that we're solving this, re resolving this hitting set problem after an addition of one constraint. And so we're solving many related problems. And although CPLEX does allow you to do like a hot start, so that if it solves related problems, perhaps it can benefit from some of the work it did in the previous iteration, we observed ex experimentally that CPLEX is not perfectly incremental. So um, we would prefer not to have to uh, call CPLEX so many times on such closely related problems. And instead, use some sort of heuristic method to replace the exact CPLEX um, computation. So in, when we use uh, non-optimal hitting sets, we can use just any sort of approximation to the hitting set problem. And this um, describes how we can incorporate those into MaxHS. So it's, very, it's a very similar idea. We have a collection of cores, and we can find a hitting set of them using an approximation algorithm. 
And if that hitting set, when removed from the formula, is still unsatisfiable, then we do get a new core, which we can add to the current collection and iterate. So we can use this approximation of the hitting set in order to uh, get a, a new core from the SAT solver. But what happens if, when you take this approximate hitting set away from the formula, the SAT solver is able to find a solution? What happens then? Well, in, in contrast to our previous, in the case where we have an exact minimum hitting set, we cannot terminate at this point because it has, um, this hitting set has potentially relaxed more than necessary, and that may be the reason why the formula is satisfiable. So what we propose to do is use a more expensive form of approximation to potentially get an even smaller hitting set. And this, given that we have this better hitting set, we ask the SAT solver again, is, there, uh, is it satisfiable? At this point, since the hitting set is smaller than it was in the previous step, there may be a core that we can find. And then if we, there is a core we can find, we go back to the top and we start using the, the first level of approximation again. We can have multiple levels of approximation. And ultimately, when we run out of levels of approximation, then we need to go to the actual exact hitting set computation. At that point, if the formula is satisfiable with that optimal hitting set, then we can terminate. So hopefully, we only have to call the exact uh, hitting set computation uh, a lot less frequently. Maybe in the best, just once. Yeah, in hopefully. the best, just once. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. OK, so that's just a summary, actually, of what I said on the previous, on the previous slide. OK, so we have different um, ideas of how we can calculate an approximate hitting set. And these are the ones that we tried. So first of all, we can build the hitting set incrementally. Every time we get a new core, you can just add any clause from that core to the hitting set. So the hitting set grows um, quite quickly as the number of cores increases. And this has the advantage that we can um, basically build the hitting set to be much larger than the optimal hitting set. But this forces the SAT solver to find cores that perhaps it would not be um, likely to produce otherwise. So it can generate a greater diversity, of course. The second method is an obvious method. You could use a standard greedy heuristic to calculate minimum um, um, a small hitting set. And that just simply favors clauses that hit the most cores for the least cost. And finally, when we have non-core constraints, it's difficult to use any sort of greedy method to find an approximation, or like a satisfying assignment for them. So at that point, if we have non-core constraints, then we can use a SAT solver to find an arbitrary solution to them, which may not have minimum cost, but we can use as a, an approximate um, solution. So using the non-optimal hitting sets, we can again look at how, what, what's the percentage of total runtime that was spent in the, uh, solving CPLEX, like using CPLEX to solve exact hitting set, and in SAT solving. So basically, the picture has changed significantly. Now, in most cases, the percentage of time it's spent in uh, optimal hitting set computation is, is low. On this slide, we're comparing the performance of this, the best version of MaxHS, which incorporates all of the um, optimizations that I've described against other state-of-the-art MaxSat solvers and CPLEX when applied to uh, the MaxSat problem. So on the, the solver that solves the largest number of problems is this um, version that we submitted to the evaluation last year. And CPLEX is also a very, very good uh, MaxSat solver, as we observed before. And then these are the other, the other MaxSat solvers, including the baseline um, of MaxHS, which was sort of in the middle of the pack before the optimizations. And these are some of the results um, from the, the last MaxSat evaluation and this year's, whose results were just uh, announced last week. Um, and this is totaling up all of the number of instances that were solved in the crafted and industrial categories. So this is not the metric that is actually used in the MaxSat evaluation, 
but it was the metric that with which we sort of developed um, this MaxAt solver. So because we are looking for a robust technique rather than focusing on any particular um, type of problem. So in 2013, we were solving the largest number of problems of any solver other than ISAC. ISAC is a portfolio, so it incorporates um, many of the other MaxAt solvers, and its performance is you know, understandably better. Uh, and in 2014, we also did very well, but there's a new solver this year, also by Fahim Bakis and Nina Neroditska at University of Toronto, called EVA 500. And EVA, the EVA solver actually did manage to solve more problems than we did. But um, it's, uh, yeah, we think, we think that we can uh, overcome that. OK, so one of the advantages of Max HS, which has made it attractive for other people who are looking to solve an optimization problem, is that we allow in the input format for there to be non-integer weights. So you, if you have some uh, real valued costs in your problem and that you don't want to scale up um, and you know, make into integers, we can, we can still accept that natively because we use the CPLEX to perform the optimization. And so the MaxHS uh, solver has actually been applied to these two applications in data visualization and learning of Bayesian networks recently in 2014. So non-integer as in uh, like real? Yeah, floating, floating point, yeah. Okay. And another, so going back to my original observation that CPLEX was a pretty good MaxSat solver, but it couldn't solve everything. Let's take a look at some problems where these are real MaxSat problems, but CPLEX, CPLEX can't really solve the original problems. So these are problems from the international timetabling competition. So I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back a couple slides to where you were showing the results of the competition? Yeah. Why isn't CPLEX mentioned here? Is it not oh, competing oh, sorry. in the competition? Oh, I'm sorry. It is actually mentioned here. It, I've, uh, because in the evaluation, it was entered under the name of ILP, Integer Linear Programming. That's a good question. Yeah, these, this is the performance of CPLEX in the competition. So it looks like it's, uh, it was pretty much ruling earlier and then starting 2014, yeah. it's nowhere near the top now. Now, there's some of, the, some of the issues there. I haven't analyzed all of the data because it, I just got it last week. But there's a different, there's a different um, subset. There's a different set of benchmarks used in the, each year's evaluation. And that can really have a, a big effect on which solver performs the best. That, for example, this solver is very strong on a particular, some particular problems, which there were many of. Because um, you know, if there's many different types of problems, then if one family of problems has you know 2,000 instances and some others only have 50, then it's biased. Um. Does the Maxat uh, competition allow portfolio solvers? Yeah, it it runs the portfolio track. It doesn't have a separate a track. track. It's not a different track. It runs them right against all the other solvers. So that's why I like to point out that this is a portfolio. So of course it solves more. I think that was banned from the set. <laughs> yeah, we don't Sartilla, have that. No, no Sartilla one. no longer rules. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Army hated it. What is the reason for banning it? People who write solvers, they hate portfolio solvers. <laughs> Why? Because a, a portfolio solver, you don't, you just take all the previous year's solvers and run them in parallel with different heuristics. I mean, you don't need to be an expert in set solving to do this. There's, it's, it's sort of very brute force, it's right? It's always icing on the cake. It can always be done, you know? That's great that it can be to solve real problems. Yeah, but it's not, it doesn't not give you many insight. I guess, I guess what that tells me is that people <laughs> really take uh, this thing about winning the competition very seriously. <laughs> I see. Yeah, they do, they do, they do, okay. they do. So I, I want to win next year, definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There was a recent Facebook post about people being very serious about winning competitions, <laughs> but I'm not serious, and therefore I saw well, some Yeah. So, 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 for example, some people are specializing on particular benchmarks, yeah. or particular class of benchmarks, and then if 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 there are people who specialize MaxSat, then the portfolio solver just you know has the best chance in each of those mm -hmm. subcategories, right? Exactly. So it generalizes by just doing a case split over a finite set that was given before. <laughs> Whereas what you're trying to do is say, hey, what are general techniques 
that are that 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 improve across a wide set of benchmarks. And yeah, I, I I would say like you know it's two different. I mean, one is a little bit more. I don't know scientific somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in machine learning, it's not scientific. I have one more. <laughs> Can you go to the, go to the next slide? I have one more comment about your technique. Yeah. So I think another strength of your technique is that it uses. Uh, sat as a black box, so the same algorithm can be used for max S and T also. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will be getting to that. Yes, it really easily we could we could really easily extend it to is max that, S and is T. Is that true? That particular these this observation and the observation that I just made is that true for any other solver yeah. that you listed in that competition? Um, I think that any of the sat based solvers, which is the other predominant technique, they could all exploit an S and T solver as well. Yeah. So they don't. They they tend to use SAT solvers also as a black box. Yeah, yeah. they okay. do. They All do. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I was I was talking about um, the fact that these are problems that CPLEX couldn't solve originally, and in the original MaxSAT formulation of these problems, um, they had very like, you know ninety three thousand variables, five hundred sixty two thousand clauses, and CPLEX was timing out on those. They're very sort of they're pretty large problems, right? Now, when MaxHS, on the other hand, which can solve these problems in you know, a pretty, pretty good small amount of time, and it's interesting to look at the final um, model that CPLEX has to solve. So in this case, the, the model that CPLEX has to solve has you know, many fewer variables and a very small number of constraints. So these are problem, this all of a sudden becomes tractable for CPLEX. And basically, you can sort of think of it as reformulating the original problem as a problem that can be solved by CPLEX. So, uh, so those, the, 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 uh, the second and third to last columns, these are the matrix for the heating set computation? Yeah, yeah. And this is actually with the basic version of MaxHS. So these are actually just strictly cores. It's great. Uh, OK, they're all positive. Yeah. Okay, and then there's some relationships um, between MaxHS and other existing work. And some of these are very, uh, really, um, very strong relationships. So in operations research, Bender's decomposition is a very old technique um, to improve the ability of solvers to solve integer programs. And Hooker, uh, John Hooker, has introduced uh, something called logic-based Bender's decomposition, where his idea is to exploit two different types of technology um, to solve scheduling problems. So in the scheduling problem, you might have something like multiple facilities and many tasks that can be carried out on each of the facilities. So the assignment of tasks to a facility um, is maybe solvable using uh, MIP solver, an integer programming solver, but the actual scheduling of the tasks, once they've been assigned to a facility, that scheduling is perhaps better done by a constraint programming solver. So logic-based benders was a way to combine those two technologies. In, in a benders de decomposition, basically the idea is that all the variables of the optimization problem are partitioned into a set X and a set Y, and then the optimization problem is just to minimize uh, some linear function of f, f of x and y subject to constraints over x and y. And the master pro the so-called master problem assigns a value um, to the variables x. And then the problem is called the inference dual, which is to infer the tightest possible lower bound on the objective function that is implied by the constraints subject to this particular setting of the values, uh, the variables x. So in, you can see MaxHS as an instance of logic-based benders decomposition, where the partitioning of the variables is basically into the B variables and the original variables. The master problem of the benders decomposition is the problem that's being solved by Cplex over the B variables. And subject to um, the solution to the master problem, the SAT solver is used to solve the subproblem over the original variables. And in the case when that subproblem is infeasible, the SAT solver is able to produce a core or a non core constraint, which actually is um, a bender's cut. And that could be given back to the master problem. 
the MaxHS approach is also very similar to something called the implicit hitting set problem, which was introduced by Chandraskaran, Karp, and Moreno Centeno. Um, they, this is uh, basically a hitting set problem where the sets that you need to hit are not available. There's potentially an exponential number of them, and the only way you have access to them is through an oracle. So given a candidate hitting set, you can ask the oracle, is there any set that hasn't been hit yet? And if there, if there is, the oracle will return one of those unhit sets. And um, if, there, if the hitting set is complete, the oracle is also able to tell you that, yes, you've hit everything. So they've, they implemented a solver for the implicit hitting set problem that also used CPLEX to handle the hitting sets. And they showed that it had very good performance on this problem in bioinformatics called multi-genome alignment. Now, in contrast to MaxHS, basically they have they assume that this oracle that generates the, the sets to hit is can run in polynomial time, whereas in our case we have uh, we're using a SAT solver as our, our oracle. So in future work, um, some of the ideas that we have to work on to improve MaxHS are to incorporate um, ideas from the liter literature, like stratification. So stratification is basically the idea of solving a MaxSat problem by taking only the clauses over, um, only the constraints over, only the clauses with highest cost, and solving that MaxSat problem to optimality, and then adding clauses of lower cost and, and resolving the problem, and then adding clauses of even lower cost. So basically, you find cores only over clauses of high cost, and this um, allows you to make progress quickly towards the optimum. And the other idea we, we should probably look at is better, more sophisticated techniques to get minimal cores, because um, there's a lot, of, a lot of work done on minimal, unsatisfiable subset computation. And, and finally, um, I'd like to extend it to max SMT. Uh, one way that we could do this is to call an SMT solver from within the MaxHS framework, um, which would be basically um, using a max SM SMT solver as a black box in place of the SAT solver. So I think that that's all. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Great. Nice Thanks. talk. Nicola, are you aware of any users of Max SMT in the program analysis context? Yes. Shubindu has, I think, talked. Stop. Yeah, tell me. Um, I mean, uh, Aditya is, is more, yes, is doing it. N Nori? Aditya Nori in that company. And then uh, uh, there's a controversial. Or, should I say, a, a paper in the PLDI this year on, on using um, MaxSat for um, uh, creating, um, by unfolding abstractions or refining abstractions um, on demand uh, for data lab based punch to analysis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, you basically, uh, the idea is to uh, limit the context sensitivity. Uh, by creating a very rough abstraction, and then when the uh, when the abstraction uh, gives the wrong results, you set up a max set problem to uh, find the, the least number of, of wow. um, contexts you need to unfold. Is this one an example of a situation where even though the worst case complexity is polynomial, they get somehow better results by making calls to an oracle that is theoretically exponential? Because, I mean, alias analysis, etc. in the worst case, is all polynomial, but if they're using max, or oh, maybe, you know, there's some, like, uh, sensitivity factor, and it gets exponential in that sensitivity factor, maybe. If the, the vanilla alias analysis is all polynomial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on what, mm -hmm. but it's uh, anyway. That that was another example. Of okay. Okay. Program analysis. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks.